yeah, economic instruments. Um, I've, I've found over the years that I've been involved in looking at this sort of stuff, it's a path to enlightened ignorance. I grew up uh, during the 40s, 50s, it was a very affluent time, but I came back to New Zealand in 1980 and I went through 26% uh, interest rates. We'd borrowed 200,000, we'd paid back 200,000 in tears, and we still owed 200,000. So, you know, when you, when you come across that sort of thing, you've got to start thinking. Uh, we were told we were undercapitalized, and yet we'd already, we had put in 200,000 ourselves. Doesn't add up. And you start looking at these things. I'd heard of the Chinese at a conference in Santiago in South America where they advised all the third world countries to declare a total moratorium on debt. Everybody at that conference, all those third world debtor nations, signed up to that agreement. Within the next six months, the World Bank and the IMF had bought every one off. Which was a great pity, because that was when things could have changed. There was a, a, a great opportunity for change at that point. It didn't happen. And all you saw after that was just little corners of newspapers, the bottom th third page or something, about how the debt of such and such a country had been restructured. So these guys have been working frantically for, I would say, the, at least the last 40 or 50 years to try and maintain a totally unsustainable system. And they've been doing a bloody good job of it. You know, they, they have managed it. I've been waiting for it <laughs> to collapse for the last 30 years. I'm still waiting. But maybe it has collapsed. And we're all just living in this illusion at the moment. I don't know. They seem to think it's still going. But anyway, after that time, I, um, I was introduced to the writings of Margaret Kennedy, uh, Bernard Leotard. I listened to the economists of... Bank XYZ, all these wet behind the ears, chief economists who didn't know their, what from their elbow. And um, I got very confused. And so I went to the local library here, found uh, J.K. Galbraith's uh, History of Economics. And I thought, well, it's a good place to start because I'd learned nothing about economics at school at all. And, oh, except I had a little, a little saving, a little piggy bank that the post office, it was, it's a real little cutie. It's a little, little brass um, <laughs> bucket, and I used to put my money in that and go and put it in the post office. That was about as much as I knew. But Galbraith said that, um, he explained everything to me in one sentence. He said, what all economists have in common is that they don't know that they don't know. And that explained it, you know, it all became clear as mud. It, it was very clear. And what we've come to depend on is all these specialists, these people who come out of college, they do a degree in economics, and that is it. They stay within that narrow confine. Now, there's a lot of really good economists around, but any of them, you'll find, have got degrees in other areas as well they've become much more generalised in their knowledge. And it's the ones that don't. We've got to get that balance right where we've got people with a whole range of skills all putting in and nobody, no one person with those skills can uh, run everything. So we need cooperation, we need collaboration. And it's interesting, somebody pointed out the other day, collaboration is what they call cheating when we're at school. We were taught we weren't allowed to cheat. We were taught we're not allowed to collaborate. We've got to compete. We've got to get out there and beat that other bastard before he takes more than, uh, or takes some of our share. And I was very privileged to be able to go to the Galapagos Islands last year and started reading up a bit about Darwin and was intrigued by the way that the economists have hijacked Darwinian theory and I think it was an economist who came up with the phrase um, survival of the fittest. That was not Darwin's phrase. And what he was studying in the later years of his life was how the most successful species were the ones that worked together, the ones that cooperated, 
the ones that collaborated. Now that doesn't make us a very successful species because we're out there competing like hell with everybody else, trying to get more than what we need, more than our share. So I have to then question, well, are we on the road to extinction? Because that's what happens to uh, species that don't collaborate, don't work together. Just a question. But I think that's all I can do, is come up with more questions. Uh, looking at all the things we were taught, and yet the things that I see that we need to be believing in are the opposites almost. We need to be learning to cooperate, to collaborate, diversify. We need to bring in resilience. Specialisation is for insects. In one of Bernard Leotard's uh, YouTube clips, he looks at a natural law which takes uh, a resilient system as opposed to a highly efficient system. And the more efficient a system is, the less chance it has of surviving because it becomes so specialised that one little thing can tip it over and it'll crash. And his uh, analogy there was a rainforest uh, and a pine plantation. Pine, planta pine, pine plantation, you chuck a match in it, boom, the whole lot can go up in flames. You chuck a match into a jungle, though, and it'll splutter and fart around and might burn out a few little things. But it's not going to take out the whole forest. The, the jungle is not nearly as efficient as that pine plantation, but it is far more resilient. And that's really what we need to look at. Resi Do, have any of you watched the story of stuff? Who knows the, the little thing, the story of stuff? There's a few of out there. This is a wonderful little learning thing that can be used, especially for young people. It goes through the story of stuff, the story of cosmetics, the story of energy, the story of finances, I think. And the, the last one they did was the story of solutions. It's an excellent view, little 10, 15 minute clips, and as an educational tool for young people, I think it's excellent. And one other little thing, yeah. Yesterday I heard of Chorkle. Who's heard of Chorkle? Good, good. Yeah, you were there. <laughs> Uh, Chalkle seems to be a platform by which people who want to learn and people who want to teach can get together. You don't have to be a trained teacher. And we're, so much of what we seem to be doing wrong is that we're all off in different rooms doing the same thing. Whereas if, we're all doing, if we all want to do the same thing, we've all got to be in the same room. So it's wonderful to see you all here, all in the same room. Let's do it. Thank you. So as Lawrence said, um, time banks are a community currency. And all community currencies are specifically designed for different purposes. And so the main purpose of time banking is, is to strengthen the core economy of family, neighbourhood and community by valuing work that's not otherwise recognised or valued. Um, so time banks can be described in a few different ways, mutual service, pay it forward, neighbourhood help, and um, the basic concept, which I'll go over again, is, is, is quite simple. Give an hour of your time helping someone, and you earn an hour of someone else's time helping you. So typical trades involve tasks that, such as gardening, computer tuition, mending clothes, transport to appointments, or, and pet minding even. Trades are recorded on a website where each member has their own profile and account and members earn time credits for the work they do. And I'll just add in here that in, with our Kaitaia Time Bank, because we do have a lot of people that don't have computer access or don't have computer skills, about a quarter of our members at the moment, we've um, developed a system where those members can still participate fully and that's through texts, phone calls, paper newsletters, um, a buddy system, and also face-to-face um, -face events that facilitate trading. So um, most people really like the basic concept of time banking, which 
it was pretty neat in itself, but as a time bank develops and deepens involvement, not just with individuals, but also with groups and organisations, then um, profound changes can start to happen in how communities function. Um, I first heard about time banking at the, the same community currencies conference that Lawrence spoke about, and it, it really resonated with me, partly because it reminded me of haymaking when I was a kid where neighbours worked together and, and relied on each other to be able to get that hay safely in each summer. The other aspects that spoke to me were that the sense of belonging, of being needed and valued, and for, for something other than just the paid work that you do, and also having a ready-made network of people to call on when needed. My partner and I moved to Kaitaia 15 years ago, and um, we had no other family here two small children and, and not that many friends. And those early years were really tough because we didn't actually feel that there was anyone we could, we could call on for help, you know, especially with child minding, the, the really hard thing. And so at times we, we did feel quite isolated and alone. And um, it takes a really long time to establish a network in a new place. And since the time bank started, um, we felt much better connected, supported, and also involved in our community. One of the core values of time banking is that reciprocity word, or, or give and take. And the message of time banks is that we all need each other. And I think for a community to function really well, everyone needs to be able to contribute because all people have talents, gifts and abilities, and many also wish to share their knowledge and skills with others. And the flip side, of course, is that we all need help sometimes too. I'm an occupational therapist by trade, so I'm, I'm really interested in people's daily occupations and how occupation or meaningful activity is, is so important for our health and well-being. I think we all need to feel needed and, and valued for what we do, and time banking is a great way to feel acknowledged for your contribution, and especially for people who are not in that paid work role. So I'm just going to talk very briefly about some of the work of Edgar Kahn, who is actually the founder of time banking, and he, he coined the phrase co-production for a new relationship between um, people who provide help in communities and, and people who need help. And um, what he, he set up was a way that pe people who are, are service users or who, who need help also provide a part in, in providing help to others or paying forward in some other way for the, the services they receive. And th this approach works because people are given the message from the start that even though they might have needs and, and something they ha need help with, that they, they also have something really valuable to contribute and are needed in their community. Khan was um, a lawyer and did a lot of pro bono work for people unable to pay for legal services. But he, um, he changed his focus and, and started asking his clients to, to pay it forward by contributing the same number of hours of service that he gave them um, to community projects in their areas. And Khan found that people were actually happy to be given a way to reciprocate for the service they'd received. And um, as a result, a, a phenomenal amount of community work was, was achieved in his area of Washington, D.C. Um, I think there's potential for some health and social services to, to enhance their service delivery by using this kind of a model, by partnering with time banks. Because uh, time banks are truly asset focused because they use whatever skills that people have to offer. So one example of this is um, the Rushy Green Time Bank in Lewisham, London is, is actually based at a GP clinic. So GPs refer people to the time bank and through the time bank members can access a poetry group walking groups, morning tea groups, and a chair-based exercise program. 
as well as the usual sort of individual services offered through time banks. So members pay time credits for participating in some of the groups and then they actually earn time credits through participating in others. And the group activities address issues such as social isolation, depression and also obesity and diabetes. The members support and help each other through participating in these groups as well as having access to a professional helper. So the people who, who need help are also viewed as, as resources for helping and supporting others. Now, um, the Littleton Time Bank that Lawrence referred to, I think provides the best example of community resilience that I know of. And Littleton has, has the most established and successful time bank in New Zealand. After the Christchurch earthquakes in 2010 and 11, Littleton Time Bank made a vital contribution to the disaster relief there. At the time of the first earthquake, 10% of Littleton residents and 18 organisations were actually Time Bank members. And um, the Time Bank acted as a hub organisation that was able to activate its extensive social network to quickly get help to where it was needed. For example, Time Bank members worked with the, the GP clinics to identify elderly people who, who were housebound and needed to be visited at home. So Time Bank members did the home visits and provided their emotional and practical support that, that was needed. And at the same time, that, that freed up the time of the medical um, professionals to be able to provide urgent medical care. And other work done by the Time Bank members as part of the relief effort included um, dismantling dangerous chimneys, organising community events to get people together to provide that support after the earthquake, um, housing homeless people, organising distribution of drinking water, and also providing hot meals to the housebound people. So the, the Time Bank was a really essential factor in the resilience of the entire Littleton community after both earthquakes. Um, so, so Time Banks are often described as, as weaving a web of community. And to give you an example of this, he, here's a trail of real trades from our Time Bank, but I've changed the names. So it, it starts out by Dan driving Rose to a medical appointment. Then Rose did some cleaning for Steve. Then Steve helped Rachel with setting up a new laptop computer. Then Rachel helped Claire with getting green waste to the transfer station in a trailer. Then Claire altered some trousers for Peter. Peter then helped Judy with sanding and painting a bookshelf. And then it just goes on and on. Um, so also resources such as sewing machines, trailers and a wood splitter are shared amongst our members. And we also use the, the Time Bank um, platform for carpooling and, and free cycling, the fancy term for giving away stuff that you don't need. What I've found uh, personally really rewarding and, and interesting through my involvement in, in Time Bank trading is how existing friendships have, have deepened and I've made a lot of new friends as well. And I've been intrigued to kind of reflect on the fact that um, even people I considered friends before joining the Time Bank um, hadn't actually asked for my help very much and I hadn't ha asked for theirs. So being part of a Time Bank seems to remove that, that obstacle to asking for help that a lot of us have. So Kaitaia Time Bank started at the end of 2009 with a, with a trial group from Transition Town Kaitaia. And, after quite a lot of groundwork and development, we, we opened up to the public a couple of years later. There's about 50 members now and quite a bit of good trading going on. We don't have any external funding at this point in time, but there's, there's six of us who, are, who are on a volunteer basis um, cover all the admin tasks. We're based at the Eco Centre across the road from here in, in the old um, lighthouse building and um, the, the office is staffed on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And we meet once a month and, and we'll, we also have to fundraise regularly to, to cover our costs. Um, 
Yeah, so there's a couple of different um, platforms for sharing information amongst all the different time banks in New Zealand. I, I believe there's about 30 at the moment. And um, those platforms have been incredibly helpful in, in getting our time bank up and running here. And the, there's a national time banking conference held most years, which again is fantastic for networking and, and support. So um, time banks typically develop in, in stages. <coughs> And once you kind of get your core membership, then organisations can be invited to join. And other New Zealand time banks have schools, youth centres, uh, service groups, sports clubs, churches, medical centres and, and community gardens as members. Time banks can support the work that, that organisations do by matching up resources with needs. So it, it's a great platform for different organisations to be able to kind of say what their, their, their people resources are, what their material resources are, and also things that they, they want to get help with. Um, time banks also um, provide the platform for many different um, member-led community projects. Members identify a project they feel is important in the community and then are assisted by the, the committee to, to develop and implement that project in, in partnership with whatever group or organisation, you know, it's most relevant to. And I've heard lots, you know, over the years about how there's all these groups doing good things in the community, but they just don't link up enough. And I think Time Bank's actually a really good platform for that linking up of, of all the different groups there are out there. Because, um, you know, it's, it's there and it's, it is a platform for, for listing, you know, what you can do as well as what, what you want. Um, oh yeah, well, yes, well it's, um, it's, free, it's, there's no money involved in the exchanges of course, it's just, it's an hour for an hour. And um, the, the membership fee is either um, I think $10 cash a year or if people don't have cash or don't want to, to pay in cash, you can actually just pay your membership in time credits, which um, about half our members opt to do. And Lawrence spoke briefly about the community chest facility where uh, members with excess credits can donate back to the community chest um, to support community projects. And some of the projects we've got under development at the moment are assisting um, schools with transport for kids for local activities when there's a shortfall of parents to provide that transport. Um, setting up distribution of spare garden and orchard produce to the food, the food bank. And also working with the Far North Environment Centre to engage volunteers for environmental projects. People join time banks because they, they want to contribute something into their community as well as being able to access the help and services available through a time bank. And um, the, the goal of any time bank is to, is to create a thriving community based on the sharing of resources, both human and material, by building networks, getting together and, and getting things done. And, and for me, Kaitaia Time Bank is about playing a part in, in reimagining and recreating a culture that, that's fair and inclusive for everyone. And um, I'm going to be around for the rest of the conference, so I welcome people who especially are interested in setting up a time bank in their own area to come and talk to me. I know quite a bit about the things not to do, <laughs> as, well, as well as a good way to progress forward with it. And, and certainly anyone who wants to talk about the, the time bank here in, in Kaitaia and how you could participate, be very happy to hear from you. Well, hi. Well, first thing I'd like to do is compliment you on your resilience to all this information that's coming out. <laughs> Look, there's two brief things that I want to uh, talk about. One is our family's experience with the uh, local currency and how it helped us at a critical time. Then I want to put a case for a regional currency. So go back 20 years, in 91, our family moved into Nelson from Tui Community in Golden Bay. 
And I got a job, a restart job, you know, one of those temporary employment schemes, money a little bit better than minimum wage, or about the minimum wage, I think it is, running a green dollar exchange. Now, that was the LEED system that, that Lawrence was talking about. I called them local employment and trading system because it was to us. We wanted to get into our own house. So we asked, asked Housing Corp for a loan. And of course, the first thing they did, they looked at our income, which was so low, and they said, oh, you can't cover the repayments. And I said, but hang on, we belong to the green dollar system, the local currency. So I put it to them that as we could buy food items, firewood, and so on, in local currency, we did in fact have enough spare New Zealand dollars to cover that. And they said, well, we haven't heard of that one before. <laughs> so I explained again, and this went on for three or four weeks, backwards and forwards, while they grasped what I was talking about. And they said, OK. So we got into a house. Local currency. That's the local currency for you. Resilience. Well, we got into this house and the carpet was pretty grubby. People had been uh, partying there in the weekends, or maybe all week. And uh, probably know the smell. We got the sky around on green dollars, local currency. And he had a good machine, and he was cleaning the carpet. And just what Rebecca was talking to, and uh, Lawrence, when you're part of this network, you explain to people what your needs are. And you, it's incredible because you're part of a network, social capital. And we said, look, we've got this clapped out old Holden, and it's due for the scrappies. It just won't pass the warrant and so on. And he said, uh, oh, he said, oh, I've got a second, hand, second car. He said, and I don't want it. He said, you can have it for a couple of thousand green dollars. So we raced round to the committee that was, that was uh, the government of the uh, green dollar system. And we said, could we have an overdraft of 2,000? And they said, oh, yeah, we, we can see that you can work up through the zero again that, um, Lawrence was talking about. We can see that you have a record. We know who you are. We trust you. So we got a car. So here we had the house to live in and a car, good transport that lasted us for five years. And we uh, went to the bottom of the South Island back several times. It did a lot of work for our business. It had veggie crates and everything in it. And that's the next part of the story. We've got this good car, transport, and we're out in the country working for an organic farmer, weeding carrots. We actually thought there must be a better way to be involved in organics than weeding carrots. <laughs> anyway, I said, I'm working at the local um, market selling my goods, just like we heard from the gentleman earlier this morning. He said, but I think there's a demand for a shop in town during the week so we can sell produce during the week. And we said, right, we're into that because the restart job, you understand, was only a temporary one and we needed something more permanent as an income. So uh, we formed a partnership that came about by being part of the network of a local currency, job creation. We were in the organic green grocery in Nelson, my wife and I, that's my wife way down there. Hello, Trish. She's the trader of the family. She was the one that could really seek out the deals and knew how to network. And uh, that business, as I said, we're in there for 12, um, 12 years. And in that business, typical small, it was literally a corner store. And, you know, we turned over four or five hundred 
thousand in the finish. So we created that business, all because we were on that network of, of uh, local currency. And in that business, during that time, we accepted a part payment in green dollars. And we employed people, partly on green dollars. Local currency, complementary currency. And I must go back and, and point out what um, Lawrence was saying. That car, really when you think about it, the full price of that car was lent to us interest-free by the community of members of that local employment and trading system. Right, that, that's pretty stunning. An interest-free loan, and they knew, knew us, trusted us to pay it back to the community coffers. So that's what you can do if we collectively um, do these things. So that's the sum up. That's housing, transport, employment, job creation. All happened to us, our family, my wife and I, and two primary age uh, uh, school kids at that time. So, you know, we were, we were on a pretty low income, having lived in a community for seven years, and our capital was rather diminished. So uh, that, that, that was really important. So what I'm asking you to do is to imagine if that opportunity was available throughout the far north. A local currency that assists in housing, transport, job creation, employment, it can help in all those things. It requires us to do some work. It requires us to design a system that will do that. And I think we need to. I think that this conference is about an invitation to work. And that's the sort of thing that we can do. And that uh, leads us on to um, a regional currency, a proposition for a regional currency. Uh, during the last five years, through transition towns in the Bay of Islands, uh, we trialled a LET system and a system of local currency notes backed by the New Zealand dollar. Now, there's other people here that you can, if you want to know what happened with that, those sort of things, you can ask. But for me, anyway, this experience has led me to believe that as far as is time for a far north district council currency to advance the well being of the far north. Yeah. Thousands of localised areas throughout the world have or are creating their own currencies. Why? Because they face similar challenges. We've heard from <coughs> Lawrence what's happening in America. It's, it's very similar. It's happening everywhere. We've heard from Ken about the monetary system. It's happening to everybody. But we have to, I believe we can respond because we've got talent throughout. We all know this is a tremendous region, it's natural wealth, that's why we're here. You know, that's how I feel about it. Um, so I want to say, I mentioned very briefly, because it has been covered in a way, but if you're looking at regional economies, then I think we need to uh, think a little <coughs> bit about the wide picture. They lack, suffer a lack of money. We think we suffer from a lack of money, and the most widely recognised reason is the large-scale swings of the national and global business cycle, they call it. And you know the story, we've talked about it today, but we need to, I think, keep in mind the wider principles. Um, you know the story of the downturn, they come along all the time. Building work slows down, gaps appear on Main Street as many businesses don't make it. Neighbours move to Australia to find better prospects for the family, and we all lose. What we lose is those skills and expertise in our community, specifically for our community. And that's what we lose every time there's a downturn. All right, now what's the lesson? The lesson is design a complementary currency to overcome that challenge. Now, um, Lawrence mentioned the WEAR system in, in um, Switzerland. 
Now, that was started in 1936 in, or 34, somewhere around about there, by businessmen. And it was simply crossing, um, it was simply um, swapping credits. And what happened, what's happened since then, is that during times of those shortages of money, it really expands. And when the banking money becomes easier, it shrunk. And at least one study from a, uh, a college professor in America said that's why the Swedish currency has been so stable, because it's had a, a local currency that's taken care of those downturns. Um, the second reason, as we've mentioned before, the, the money uh, leaks out of the region. We go down and we shop at the, uh, at the supermarkets and we shop at chain stores um, and so on, and it puts money out of the district. The profits from those places that are not owned locally goes out of the district and is invested in other areas. So we're losing that um, investment uh, money. And also the banks. If you're banking with Australian banks, what do the profits do? They go out somewhere else. The shareholders are elsewhere. And we've heard several um, options of, of how we can keep money in here by having local uh, savings pools and so on. OK, that was the second reason. And finally, um, we've got the reason of the nature of the uh, national currency. And we've heard it before, but I don't apologise for uh, repeating it because it's very important. Because we've been swimming in this water like the air around us and it takes a lot of hard thinking to really think about it. Most of the money that we use is created when you or somebody else goes to bed. And they simply type in these days, they simply type in a debt entry. Now that money has to be paid back over time as you spend it into the community and people do things with it. Plus the interest. And that interest is never created. And immediately, you've got scarcity. And that's what all this musical cheers is about in the world. There's never enough money in the economy to service the debt and pay the interest. And that's why we need local currency to cover that, um, that scarcity. So, One, one thing I want to recommend then is that you have a look at the, the uh, web page of the Social Trade Organisation. Now these people have decades of experience at designing money systems to assist regional economies. The experience is out there. They've got the software, Cyprus, which we can pick up, which we as a region can pick that cur currency um, the site must program up and it will run several types of uh, complementary currencies. So, in conclusion, here's an historic opportunity to develop a money systems that are suitable for our place and pass those skills on to future generations because they haven't been passed on to us. <coughs> it's a historic occasion. We can pick up the knowledge that we've heard here that here heard here this afternoon, and uh, make sure that we're passing it, those skills on to future generations. I see a future where, peop where, uh, the people, where, where people can use the currency systems that suit their needs. It's folly su to suggest that one type of money can ad adequately fulfil everyone's needs. So I support a regional, along with others, a regional currency to increase the ownership of the Far North's ability to create the means of exchange that suits the challenges we want to solve. So I support joining with others having a Far North District Council currency to promote the people and economic well-being of the Far North. And I'd be pleased to hear your reaction and I'd be pleased to talk to anyone interested in the project. Thank you. The challenge was, will the Far North District Council pick up this?
Now, Neil was the brave one that said that. If you were asking me, I would say, yes, we'll do it, we'll pick it up. But you need to remember that I am one of ten. We have Councillor John Fusich here today too, who's heard it all, and I'll be tapping him on the shoulder for some strong support. But it's going to take quite a bit of fortitude and discussion and head banging and education to make this happen. Let me tell you about just one way that I think the Far North District Council could be involved. Now, contrary to what Neil says, I don't believe the Far North District Council should run this dollar. Yeah. I think it needs to be a community-led organisation assisted by the council. Council is not always the right organisation to run these sorts of things. Now, council could be involved in the following way. Say, in our long-term plan, and we've got plans of plans of plans, we have 10-year plans, and we have three-year plans, and we have one-year plans, and we plan until the cows come home. But say, in our 10-year plan, in five years' time, we had a project for building a bridge up here in Kaitai, for instance. It could be a footpath in Kirikiri or it could be something else in Kaikaui. And say that project was going to cost $50,000. And it was five years' time. The community could come to us and say, we don't want to wait five years. Let's do this project now. So the council says, mm, we haven't got the money yet. We don't want to put people's rates up. We don't want to put any more pressure on. So, but what we could do was say to that community, you find a contractor that's willing to be paid in local dollars. You sign up 80% of your businesses in your community to accept the local dollars. And we'll pay for that project using local dollars. Now, what we would do is have that currency issued on the basis that it had to be used four times every year over the next five years, and then the holder of that currency could use it to pay their rates. What the long shot of that is, is the council pays no more for that project and no sooner for that project than they would do at any, as they had planned. But in the meantime, the community have got that project done earlier, they've had the use of it for five years, and it has created over a million dollars worth of economy in the district. And just think of all the businesses that that would assist. So I think that's one way council could be involved without too much of a problem. There are other ways they could be involved, and I guess it's just going to be something that we need a lot of work done. I had hoped that there'd be a lot more councillors here to listen to this today. However, it's being videoed, so we'll be getting them to sit down and watch it. But remember, this is going to take a lot of community input because I don't believe that the council is the right person to own this scheme. So, thank you. Thank you, Di. Um, and and Di's going to um, over to England to check out some, some currencies that are operating there, the Bristol Pound. And um, so she's keen, she's a player on it. And that's good. It, pain, very important point, Pete, Di. So, that's, so you're very lucky to have a champion within council. Go, Di, that's excellent. <laughs> and I think, oh, sorry, Kenny, if you don't mind saying so, I think that um, Di's absolutely right. The council shouldn't run it, it's whether the council will back it and by saying we will participate, we'll be a participant and we'll take 5% of anything that goes over the counter at, at council will we'll, um, we'll take in local currency and that's a really good backing. Then you need your power company to say the same and then that's a real important support that gives people the confidence, your local business people. And this is, this is a core business development thing because you're going to, um, you know, because this is the way business can do more trade. I don't want to be all doom and gloom, but I want to ask an obvious question, perhaps. 
Um, with time banks and alternative currencies, how does government view that in terms of any ACC, health and safety and employment taxes and that kind of um, setup? Can anybody address how you dealt with those formalities in the other system? In Littleton, everybody who becomes a member of the Time Bank has a police check. So it doesn't matter if you have got a criminal record or you're a pedophile. You don't obviously give a pedophile a job of looking after children. But um, there are maybe they can deliver newspapers, you know, like, um, I think as far as ACC and all that goes, this is probably a very fundamental point that they have in Littleton. I don't know if you do that in. But, um, that's Just on the taxation issue, alternative currencies are not a tax dodge. If, if you are supposed to pay tax on, on barter income, and there is a certain level of, I think it's on about a couple of hundred dollars, the IRD has a set record of about $200 per year from income that's, that's under cottage garden industry. Depends on if it's your mainstream business, if you're registered for GST and you're doing trade, then you, then you have to pay your GST on it. And that can be a disadvantage, but you would weigh that against the fact that you've got trade that you wouldn't have got um, otherwise because you didn't have to pay the Kiwi dollars and, and marketing and the like to get the business that you got through the network you belong to, but it's, it's not a tax dodge. If tax is due, you pay that, but it increases trade. That is a great way of creating um, business and enterprise you wouldn't get anyway, especially for mainstream business. That's, that's you know, stuff they're not selling, not a service or product they wouldn't be selling otherwise. So unused inventory gets to find its place into the... I'd just like to follow on a little bit about the Bristol Pound. Not only does the mayor get 100% of his salary, the CEO gets 5,000 quid of her salary in Bristol Pound. Bristol businesses can pay their business taxes, you can ride the buses, and there are 600 businesses already involved. Now this is something that is not promoted directly by the council. Now the city of Hull, which is in my native county of Yorkshire, their local council is actually promoting the whole coin. I had hoped that the far north might be the world's first to introduce it, so we've got to get our skates on, otherwise those canny people in York will beat us to it. <laughs> Lawrence spoke at some length about the Federal Reserve Ponzi scheme. Well, the New Zealand banking system is no different. It's just one big Ponzi scheme. And if you have any, if you wonder at all what's going to happen to your money, if and when something like Worstpac goes under, all you need to do is look on the Reserve Bank's website and click on a thing called OBR, which stands for Open Bank Resolution, and it tells you in no uncertain terms what they're going to do with your money when the bank goes bust. So that you can check out for yourselves. Uh, the stats, because I did read up, 15% of uh, youth in uh, the Taitokoro are unemployed. 43% um, of the population of the Taitokoro are Māori. So my figures are there's a lot of my young people don't have a job. Anyway, we can do a deal. Quite a lot about this one. 
um, systems where they can be doing something productive and be getting credits for the contributions they're making. And I have to admit, I haven't come up with any answers um, just yet, but I'm hoping that some of the people that I've been able to network with at this um, conference can sort of help along that path. And when I first started the time back, someone came up to me at the market and they said, you know, if you want this thing to work, you've got to get Māori involved. And, you know, I'm, I know that, but I just, I don't know how that, and that's being honest, it's, it's really important, but I, I just don't know how to do it, so maybe we can, you know, talk some more about that, come up with some ideas to get things happening. The, um, using, uh, um, the, the regional currency as well could be a good place to start as well if you have an online buy sell swap uh, website and you know they can go online and that takes that works in local currency then people can get the kind of things that they, they might like whatever it is I don't know what the kids often like technology or applications you know games da -da -da -da, you know cell phones um, so that they can buy and sell stuff that they like using local currency using the platform the kind of things that they you know it's not like they don't like spending time on the, on the social media. Or yeah, um, uh, what I'm trying to allude to, I suppose, we've got this great um, economy. It's our young people. Now, we're, they're sitting there, no more time, are wasted, sitting over there, and we kind of look at them and say, well, you've not really got any skills, you don't have any value, in service, etc., etc. et cetera, so just sit over there and we'll figure out what to do with you later in your 30s. I think we need to have a big discussion about that now and try and do what Beck is trying to do and, and find that connection. Let's find that connection between this summit and those young people that are out there who are, you know, but haven't got much on their plate to keep them occupied. Uh, let's perhaps discuss the social positives of creating an economy based around them. All of these uh, initiatives as opposed to just trade. Trading material, trading product, uh, and trading what's value for value. Because those young people out there need the answers out of the summer. Yeah, I, I just respond to that. Um, that's exactly the question that we need to ask. Now, I mentioned the social trade um, organisation, they've been doing this for decades. They go into a region, can you hear? Okay. Yeah, okay. Um, they go into a region that's been economically depressed, and what they found was that you couldn't drag in the mining or the big things or the cooperatives, you had to look at what were the resources unused in the district, and that's exactly the young people are a huge resource. Now, I don't know the specific answer because I don't know what the other balance is up here. What do you need to do? Do you need to build the houses? Or one of it, you know, it's for local people to decide what are the unused resources and match them up so that money is not a lack of problem. For example, the easiest one I can think of off the top of my head is, is the commercial flybys. The airlines had empty seats. So they created a, 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 a thing that would progress their business by filling those empty seats, flybys, and now you can do it, you know, you can use it anywhere. Well, that's the principle. You define what the problems are in the community or the challenges, like that huge, and I think this is the most important thing that we can ever do as, as leaders in the community, is to make sure that the youth are employed or occupied usefully and that they can bring up, you know, one of the statistics of the, of the far north is that there's a huge gap of, uh, of young people here because they have to do the work. That's a hole in any community. Well, that's the sort of thing that we need to um, create the finance, the money to fix. I haven't got the answers, but that's the right question. Ken. Uh, John Maxwell from Kururaraka, Russell. Just to follow on from what Ruben and you were saying, uh, I'm a member of the Russell Futures 
organisation, organising group. When we first put this to our community uh, to look at things that we could involve our youth in, I invited uh, to the schools to take part in it. We had about a dozen school kids turn up. We did a lot of brainstorming with school kids and with the local people who were interested in what we wanted to achieve. Those school kids put up some pretty good ideas, but we haven't seen them at another single meeting since then. And what I want to really emphasize is we've got to get these kids along for the meetings, and not only have we got to get them along, we don't do what they want us to achieve. We do, or they do rather, what they want. We involve them in achieving what they want. If we do it all for them, there's no value in it. Thank you. I think that uh, the previous speaker had it on here. Um, young people like skateboarding, they like surfing, they like singing, they like all sorts of things. One of the things that the uh, Littleton group did with new members was they paid them to read that uh, book by Edgar Khan in time dollars, or time, sorry, time hours. Now, there's no reason why you cannot pay young people to teach young people surfing, to teach skateboarding, to organize concerts. Um, you can pay them to go and learn how to pluck possums. You can play, pay them to do anything you like. Hours don't cost anything for the time bank. The time bank can create that, those hours into existence through the activities of young people who, when they've paid it, can then use that to get services in return. And the, that is the challenge, is what do they want? They might want to be able to come to a concert, and the council might come to the party and support the costs of setting up a concert. They, you know, it, it, you've just got to be very creative about it and give people what they want, and don't think that time is scarce. It's abundant. We give it away. That's, that's the nature of it. I love that, Brian. And, and that's about telling the story. It was, it was actually what I mean, you were saying, Jane, earlier also about some of the activities that people do in the far north that, you know, hunting and fishing and stuff or, or you know, doing stuff at home that may not get recognised as, as, as a, a proper job but is actually a, a valuable activity and the like. So there, there is a lot in how you tell the story and how you put a value system around it. Like, you know, um, and... Uh, and you know, it's, it's a mind concept. You can pay people to do things that they like to do. We don't all have to do jobs we hate, you know. That's um, <laughs> that a strange concept. And, and, and the young ones, you've got to fake it till you make it. You know, that's what we used to say in, in one area of work that was pretty challenging. Fake it till you make it. Experiment. With the savings pool scheme we got involved with, there were seven people doing an experiment. Now, there's 20 of them up and down New Zealand. It might change the whole paradigm of peer to peer um, learning in New Zealand. But experiment. Look at what you're doing as an experiment. Play with it. Goodness sake. You know, I think we can afford to. And that's where council, your other council, they're not probably all as enlightened as like they Council should throw some effort at, at it. You know, experiment, play, it doesn't matter to fail. Have a go. What are you going to waste? You know, um, what our future? So uh, I love that, Brian. You know, get the kids, pay them to, to, to teach other, to do things that they like doing and want to do and get it, fake it till you make it, make it so. Um, Ken's leading speak this time, I'm out of order. I just wanted to endorse the sentiment of the gentleman down the back very quickly. When we first started talking about foundation communities um, and looking at what was happening in the far north, we identified that volunteerism is really massive up here already. So what we're talking about, one of the things I thought when we were hearing these presentations is that old saying, you know, teaching grand to suck eggs. We have massive amount of koha. We have people that share their resources and distribute equally um, within their whanau, within their communities already. And we already know there's a lot of barter and trade and exchange. So I think there's an element of within what's being discussed here of how do you formalise that and include people who aren't necessarily in that, you know, who are operating outside of that. 
But on the other hand, I'm also very aware of people like my parents who've been up here for 33 years, who have spent literally thousands of hours in volunteer activity. And they, because of their culture, would feel a little humiliated and embarrassed if anybody attempted to log any of that in a time bank, or in any way thought that they weren't giving it freely. They give it to the communities as a gift, because they can. So I don't think that they would automatically want to sign in to a system that would count that or, or expect any reciprocation. And they wouldn't necessarily want to ask. So I think there's a little bit about those kind of cultures that we might want to discuss more and how you might break that down. So I just wanted to endorse what you're saying. We identified really quickly in starting this work that there's a lot of volunteerism and it's also that volunteerism um, means that there's an alternative economy operating and it's a barrier to getting into full-time formal work. Because if you're already committed to the gardening or the fishing or the hunting or looking after somebody's children or perhaps visiting an elderly um, kaumatua, you can't just drop all that to go into 40 hours a week full-time employment. So. Oh, kia ora koutou, I'm Danine McVeigh from, from Rawani. I've been in Hokianu for about 40 years. I'm one of those older people. <laughs> been around forever doing stuff. Um, my, my particular um, interest is I'm, I'm an educator, I'm a teacher, I'm down part-time, and I'm, though I work online, I'm associated with the Rawani campus. Now, I actually, in coming back to really what Reuben was saying about young people, um, the campus is hugely under underutilised um, in the normal way that things are, evenings, weekends, holidays, Christmas, all that. Um, I think it really needs to be a kind of maker space and it really needs to be, it, actually the land belongs to the council, councillors please take note. Um, quite a lot of the buildings were put there by the community, mainly what the Polytech does is pay tutors and provide things like computers and some of the other equipment, furniture and stuff. I would love to see us working alongside our council um, and North Tech and anybody who's interested in using that as a kind of a maker space or a resource for any kind of, you know, anything to go on the, in, on the lines of what Lawrence was talking about, whether it was mutually educational or creative or, a, a, you know, just a sort of a base space for all sorts of things that people could do. Um, so that would be what I would really like to see. So I think we'll get some conversation going like that from the staff and, and so on so shortly. Janine or Janet? Janine. Janine. Janine, um, that, and you'll be surprised when you open up a place like that how much mm. things get donated. I've seen whole beautiful workshops mm. and all the tools were donated, some things like lathes that would have been scrapped and the like. Stuff starts coming out. I've seen it with a green bike scheme as well where suddenly people just the place filled up with bikes and we, we didn't believe it would happen but the other people in Palmerston all said, you watch, it'll happen. So you open the doors and the stuff will, pe people love to do it and then people come forward who've got skills in welding or, or the like oh, and they want to give it. Brilliant art tutors, horticulture tutors, painting tutors, te reo Māori. I mean there's all sorts of things that people could do that use that place for and it's got beautiful subtropical gardens and fruit trees. And do it, do it. It, yeah. it and, and it should be fun. Fun, creativity, art, you know, it's, it's, it's beautiful. I want to come visit. My name is Karina. I'm from Switzerland and I came here to Kaitaia for the first time on Friday. And I spent the weekend with lots of youth during the Life Pack weekend that took place in Kaitaia. Life Pack is a program that um, engages young people to create well being projects with a technological aspect to it. So I saw the most amazing, inspiring young people in your community who stepped up and said, we want to support young people in our community. So young people are really there and they have amazing ideas and amazing projects came out of that weekend. One project here in Kaitaia is the Project Opportunity that wants to connect all these offers like Time Bank and Janine, like a space like that and all the tutors that are there to support young people. The project opportunity wants to connect those offers with the actual young people that it often doesn't reach. And um, another cool project that came out of the weekend was a group of music teachers who want to teach young people how to sing and uh, develop their creative arts and get employment through that. So there's so much great stuff happening. And I really, anybody who wants to connect with these young people, please come and speak to me. They're, they're full of energy and want to create change. 
Thank you, Karina. Um, Gail, and then the microphone to Nicole, please. Um, I just had a really small question for Rebecca. Because um, my understanding from what you said before, Rebecca, about your time bank system was that the people who are the committee or the organising group, that they don't actually get paid for what they do. And I wondered what the barrier was to paying yourself in time so that everybody shares the time. Because I think when people are doing roles like that, it's really important that groups appreciate their time as well and it's part of that. So I just wanted to know if there was a barrier to that. that, that that's a really good question. And... Um, when our time for bank first started out, there was a very small number of us and everyone got paid in credits for the time they were putting in. But we found the time bank was just too small at that time to, to be able to kind of really work properly while we were all being paid credits for, for the time that we were putting in. As time banks grow and get bigger, and there's more diversity and more people, then it, it becomes more possible for that to work. And I've, I've been thinking to myself, we're just about at that point now where we can start paying, being paid for at least some of the hours that we put in to run it. And, and that is a bit of a point because in order for it to be sustainable, those of us putting in those hours really do need to, to be credited for our time. Thanks, Rebecca. Nicole? I'm Nicole Foss from Canada. Uh, this is my field, <laughs> so it's a, a tremendous interest to me and especially to see what people are actually doing in, in this area is absolutely fascinating. Now, what happens when you don't have enough money in circulation, as we heard, is you create a situation of artificial scarcity. So coming up with your own form of liquidity allows you to resolve that situation of artificial scarcity. So you have the resources, you have the people, but if there's not enough money in circulation, you can't connect the two, and it's very difficult to actually utilize the resources. So even under current circumstances, having something like a local currency can make an enormous difference because then you, you do have a mechanism to utilize the resources you have. And because it, the local currency must circulate only in the local area and can't leave, it's a tremendous support for the, the velocity of money locally. I would like to point out, though, that uh, it's not just under current circumstances that this will be useful. Uh, the future is going to be a rather a lot more unstable than, than people think at, at a global level. Uh, Jeff was talking about the global Ponzi scheme. Well, pyramid schemes like that don't last forever. They implode. And 2008 was, as was pointed out earlier, uh, the warning shot across the bow. It was not the main event. That's still to come. The, uh, the resolution of the enormous amount of global credit and debt is, is still ahead of us. And what this will do when the credit dries up, and we, we got a sense of credit drying up in 2008, but only a sense of it, what will happen when the credit does dry up in earnest, because it's the vast majority of the money supply, there will be very, very much less money in circulation than there is now. So these local currencies that you can start now that have a benefit today could have an absolutely staggeringly large benefit tomorrow because then you will really be seeing the situation of artificial scarcity. When bubbles burst, that's what they create. In the 1930s, in uh, the global Great Depression, the people who lived through that time said, we had everything except money all the people, all the resources. In the States at the time, they had a virgin continent's worth of resources. They couldn't do anything with it because they crashed the global operating system, which was the financial system. So the places that were able to resolve that situation of artificial scarcity with a local currency did very, very much better. However, a money monopoly is the most significant power that you can possibly have, so it will be defended and it's not going to be harder to do some of these things in the future. It's especially going to be harder to have something issued by a local government, even although having something issued by a local government when you can pay your rates in it is the most effective mechanism <coughs> for introducing a, a local currency. It will be difficult to do that. But nevertheless, these currencies are very much the way forward, the way to achieve a, a benefit in, in depressed areas now and to resolve uh, an impending uh, very difficult situation going forward. And Jeff mentioned that open banking resolution. What that does is permit the failed banks to be bailed out with the depositor's money. So you might want to look up what happened in Cyprus, where that, that happened last March. Um, very much, uh, the banks were all bailed out with the depositor's money, and the depositors didn't walk away uh, very, very happy from that. 
So that's the kind of situation that's, that's coming. And what you're talking about here today is the way to navigate that period of crunch and then reboot the operating system. About people who are already in the habit of being helpful to others may be resistant to the idea of formalizing and having their, their contribution counted. I think it's helpful to have a look at the relationship between the giver and the receiver. It is a kind of a relationship that is like this, top down, the giver and the receiver. Now there is a place for that, there is a time and place for charity. We need it. However, where it is an option, and I think it is very often an option, Rebecca mentioned co-production earlier. This is where we turn that relationship on its axis and we, we have a dance between the giver and the receiver so that both are equally giving to one another in a circle of giving and receiving. So that changes the whole relationship. It's about the dignity, preserving the dignity of the receiver. It's also about levelling out and helping us to be more comfortable as receivers. Because most of us much prefer to give than to ask and receive. That's the thing, we need to get over that. The other thing is when they, uh, I, I organised a presentation about time banking in our area in the Wairarapa and we had the coordinator from the Wellington Time Bank describe the first three months of activity in their time bank in Wellington. And there was a lot of stick figures all connecting on a big white paper. They had heard too oh, we're already well connected, we already do lots of stuff in the community. She described that first three months and commented, about three of these people knew each other before all this activity. So the opportunity to, if you love giving, the opportunity to extend your capacity to give is enhanced if you're part of a time bank. The other thing is that if you don't want to draw on your credits, then there is the community bank, the community pool, the community chest. And so you can contribute as much as you like of your accumulated credits, credits into that community chest. That means actually that the, the original gift of your giving has been doubled you have doubled your gift to the community. You have preserved the dignity of your partnership in trade, so we say, and you have extended your capacity to reach others and to be ministered by others, and you have given twice because now that community chest can enable so much more in your community. Thank you, Helen. Quite beautiful. Warren Snow, Ahipara, living in Auckland at the moment. Um, I just want to appreciate the vision behind this conference and uh, the tremendous presentations. I think, I think the real big thing that's coming out for me is the importance of uh, local currencies that value things that the mainstream economy doesn't. And that's what, that's what this whole uh, sustainable economic development concept is about, valuing different things to the things that the mainstream economy values but has locked up so that we can't or when i say we people that want to value different things find it very hard to do that so i think these local economies and i have a lot of time with people like rebecca and helen that have just stuck with this concept um and giving and it's it's very small and it's a, been a big battle to get it to where it is but i think it's at a tipping point where a lot of people like me have sort of been hanging around the edges are going to jump in both feet boots and all. Um, 
that we had a conference here in Kaitaia just about 25 years ago, and I'll never forget somebody saying at that conference, a community that's not in control of its economic processes won't be in control of its social processes. And I don't know who it was, but it was just perfect, and I've never, ever forgotten it. And no matter what you say, you need a means of exchange, and the means of exchange has been captured by um, corporations that are finding ever, ever more creative ways of getting into the community uh, till, if you like, and, and sending that money straight back out of town, and, and it's not refreshing the economy. So I just did a little calculation here, and I, I'm not very good at math, so I got Norman here, who seems a little better than me, to uh, help with the calculation, and uh, we worked it out. I wish the ref show a denial. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Well, no, he's not that good. It took him, it took him a while to work it out. But anyway, uh, we worked it out that if you were to divert, t if, if half of the people in New Zealand were to divert, so it's, it's only you know 2.25 million people, were to divert $10 of their money away from uh, things that take that money straight out of town to the local economy, like buying... Um, I use the, you know, the example buying your, your relish and your chutney and your jam at the market and buying your fruit and veggies at the market. So $10, half the population spent $10 a week. That's the equivalent of a corporation to the value of 1.1 something billion per annum. Now, just think what 1.1 billion retained in, in New Zealand communities would, would, would be in terms of jobs. So if we're looking at things we could all do tomorrow, it's only $10 a week. You can't tell people they can't shop at Pack and Save because they're, they're pauperised by this pauperising economy. But maybe they can spend $10 locally to help create local jobs and refresh the local economy. Um, and for that, so, you know, there's, there's very few companies in New Zealand that are 1.1 billion in scale, and they have a large number of jobs that they create. So, just a thought. 10 bucks a week, let's give it a go. Thank you, Warren. Um, the lady here, thank you. I was struck by the mural out there, not on the head, but in my thought, that the um, street sides of Kaitaia a century ago were dominated by Shell, British Insurance, Hollywood movies and bought in groceries. <laughs> so we're trying to turn quite a long-standing tide here, just a thought. Um, I think this is a rare and fantastic opportunity. Maybe it's the first time in a quarter of a century, um, as indicated by Warren. Just the main thing I wanted to say was, barter me for the youth. Not trade me, barter me. Barter me, trade me, they'll get it. And... Um, are there any Habitat for Humanities jobs around here? Because that would be a wonderful thing to link with Time Bank. Just, I mean, we had the opportunity to help a young man who got into a dodgy situation years ago. And I feel we did help him make restitution for damage he'd done in public, full view on a gala day. Um, he turned around and built a home for his little family and that's the next time we met him hitchhiking and I just thought, you know, he's taken a fair few steps. Good on him. Yeah, we, we've just <coughs> completed a community project in, in the Open Aid in Lampard. And that was done with a lot of the community groups like the Ratepayers, the Tourism Association, the Lions, a lot of community people, as well as some of the school kids and the school, the Open Aid in Lampard area school. And that was painting a huge mural in Open Aid in, in Open Aid near the eyesight. I don't know how many people have seen that, but it's an incredible work of art. Now, if we had uh, local dollars at work there, I'm sure we could have had the use of a lot more people to take part in that mural. And you see the advantages of doing that. Give them money, even if it's sort of uh, funny money, as people have been saying, they would, they would have given them something. But my, my grandkids worked on that mural. On that. They would have had funny money in their bank account all of a sudden. But that, they, they were happy with having their name painted on the wall as contributing. But the thing that concerns me is that so many of our resources are going to waste. Like, look at all the pine trees that are being harvested now. 
and they're going as whole logs to China. You know? yeah. We should be looking at sort of what can be done in the local community. Because if we can do something in the local community with those, then we've got jobs, you know, and that jobs, those jobs are in the local community that stays there. So one of the things that we could use the younger generation for is helping us plant trees everywhere, you know, like, like sort of in, in our communities, in our towns, along the riverbanks and things like that. And if they're, they're happy to receive their payment in, in, in community dollars, then, 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 it's, then it's a real benefit to everybody that's involved. Now, I don't know how we're going to achieve getting those kids involved in sort of projects like that, but we've got to be able to sort of show to them that they're going to benefit in the long term, because it's going to create jobs in the community, and it's going to sort of beautify the community that they live in. My kids, several of them want to come home, but they won't come home because there's no money in the area, and the education system in Abernathy is not the best. Basically, because the school roles have dropped, because the younger generation had to leave the area, so the school roles have dropped. So what we're on, that there's on offer is very little. So we've got to look at sort of the whole thing, the whole process, of getting everybody involved and getting this thing off the ground. I wanted to make a couple of comments. Uh, one, uh, we had Dale Williams up here several years ago from Oklahoma, and he has a model, and he did it in Oklahoma. He just got the town together to do it. You know, his model's on the internet. He just wanted to spread the word. He's not up here. He wasn't up here to do it for us. But he got, he could see the gap between businesses who needed employees who stayed in their job and kids coming out of school that didn't have work. And he said, what? why is there no connection there? And so he said about asking questions to find out. Now, I mean, I think he's a New Zealand model. I think the guy's a New Zealand hero. Uh, but he's not going to do it for us. He just kind of spread the word. So I just wanted to mention him, because that's what we're looking at, too. They were Williams, Mayor of Yeah. Uh, the other thing was local community currencies. Uh, I guess one of the things for me is money, I mean, I didn't even know how many was created two years ago. Money is created out of nothing by private hands. And they then charge us interest to use their money. And Nicole Foss just called it a money monopoly. And that's exactly what it is. It's incredibly lucrative. <laughs> They're not going to let go of that. I may have the name of the country wrong, but recently I was reading about a local community, and I think it was I keep thinking Nicaragua, but I think the country was Africa, where the village created their own community currency, and they went from starvation to thriving. They were doing really well, and the country stepped in and said, no, you can't do that. Now, they had to take that to their Supreme Court, and I just read something recently that they had wanted to, which is a huge success. But if we do create a genuine community currency that works, there's going to be some pushback. So I just want to throw my two bits. Thank you. That is a possibility.